My name is Ethan Blake, a former Navy SEAL, and this is a story that haunts me to this day. I'd always known there were parts of this world humans were never meant to explore, but it wasn't until that one fateful mission that I truly understood. If you're reading this, I need you to believe me. There are creatures out there, ancient and hidden, that defy everything we know about life on Earth, and we encountered them. It started in late October when we received orders from the top. A classified briefing was scheduled and the team was summoned. When we arrived in the cold concrete room, everyone was already on edge. Our lieutenant, a man named Commander Lewis, wasted no time. He got right to the point. We're being sent to a remote island in the Pacific, he announced, his voice cold. A research team has gone missing. They were studying marine life around an unexplored trench off the island's coast. Our mission is to locate them, assess any threats, and extract any survivors. As we sat there exchanging wary glances, Commander Lewis pulled up a series of images. They showed grainy underwater footage, strange shapes moving in the shadows of the trench, large and unmistakably alive. One of the shapes seemed to have multiple limbs, and another had a long, eel-like body, too massive to fit within the camera's view. These aren't typical marine life, Commander Lewis continued. We're calling them Species X until we know more. Our intel suggests that these creatures are territorial. Keep your wits about you. They're bigger and faster than anything we've encountered. Our team of eight was composed of some of the most highly trained men in the SEALs, but the fear in that room was palpable. After a tense flight over open ocean, we arrived at the island. It was small, mostly covered in dense jungle, with high cliffs on the east side that plunged straight down into the ocean. We set up base near the coast, where the research team's camp had been found abandoned. Their equipment was scattered, tents ripped apart, and sand was littered with strange marking. Prints that looked almost like webbed feet, but with claws. Our team medic, Jack Harmon, knelt down to examine the tracks. He looked up, his face grim. These aren't human, he said, his voice barely above a whisper. We spent the rest of that day searching the camp, hoping to find clues or any sign of survivors. The jungle was eerily quiet the kind of silence that makes your hair stand on end. I couldn't shake the feeling that we were being watched, and by the looks of the other guys, they felt it too. As night fell, we gathered around a small fire, keeping our weapons close. None of us talked much. We were all thinking the same thing, that the creatures were out there, just beyond the tree line, watching and waiting. It happened in the dead of night, we were woken by a distant, splashing noise coming from the shoreline. Without a word, we grabbed our rifles and moved in formation toward the sound. The moon cast a ghostly glow over the water, illuminating something massive just beyond the surf. At first, it looked like a massive log floating in the waves. But as we got closer, the log began to move, lifting itself up on thick, muscular legs. It was at least twelve feet tall, with slimy, scaly skin that glistened in the moonlight. Its head was elongated, almost like a crocodile's, but with piercing eyes that glowed an unnatural yellow. Its mouth opened, revealing rows of razor-sharp teeth. For a moment, none of us moved. Then it let out a guttural hiss that sent us into immediate action. Commander Lewis shouted, Engage, and we opened fire, bullets ripping through the air, but the creature barely flinched. It stepped forward, swiping a clawed hand through the air and sending one of our men, Private Miller, flying back with sickening force. His body landed in the sand with a thud, lifeless. The creature stared at us, as if studying us, before slipping back into the water. We stood there, weapons drawn, our breaths ragged. One man down, and we hadn't even scratched it. The next day, Commander Lewis informed us that the mission had changed. High Command wanted us to dive into the trench where they believed the creatures might be nesting. It was a suicide mission, and we all knew it. But we were SEALs trained to follow orders, no matter how insane. We geared up, 
each of us wearing state of the art diving suits and equipped with underwater rifles and sonar equipment. The descent was slow and eerie. The water grew colder and darker as we went deeper, and soon the sunlight faded completely. About 200 feet down, our sonar detected movement. Something big was circling us just beyond the range of our lights. I tightened my grip on my rifle, heart pounding in my chest. And then I saw it. A flash of pale, scaly skin, massive jaws lined with teeth, eyes that glowed in the darkness. It was a different creature than the one we'd seen on the shore. This one was longer, with fins and tentacles that floated like ghostly tendrils in the water. It moved with a deadly grace, circling us, studying us. Commander Lewis gave the order to fire, and we unleashed a barrage of bullets into the water. The creature let out a shriek, and I felt a wave of nausea as the sound reverberated through me. One of the tentacles lashed out, wrapping around Corporal Jensen and yanking him into the darkness. His scream was cut short, replaced by silence. One by one, we were picked off. Jack Harmon was next, then Torres. Each time, the creatures struck from the shadows, dragging men into the depths before we could react. There were only three of us left, me, Commander Lewis, and Sergeant Waller. Our oxygen was running low, and we were losing hope. But then, just as we thought all was lost, we spotted a narrow crevice in the trench wall. With no other options, we swam inside, squeezing through the tight space. The creatures followed, but the crevice was too narrow for them. We could see their glowing eyes peering in, frustrated and hungry. After a few tense moments, they retreated, leaving us in eerie silence. We spent hours in that crevice, too afraid to leave. When we finally surfaced, it was dawn. We crawled onto the shore, exhausted, broken. Six men were dead, and we had nothing to show for it except our own survival. We returned to base, but things were never the same. High Command tried to bury the mission, labeling it as classified and telling us not to speak of it. They even threatened us, warning that our lives and the lives of our families were at risk if we ever revealed what we'd seen. Commander Lewis resigned a week later, his spirit broken. Sergeant Waller moved out to the middle of nowhere, saying he couldn't sleep knowing those things were out there. As for me, I've spent every day since then trying to forget, but I can't. I still hear the shrieks, see the glowing eyes in my nightmares. I know those creatures are still out there, lurking in the depths, waiting and someday they'll come back. I've been in the Navy SEALs for nearly 15 years. I've seen my fair share of war zones, covert missions, and classified operations. We're trained to adapt, to expect the unexpected, to handle anything. But what happened in Bosnia? I'm not sure any of us were ever truly prepared for that. This was back in 1999 during the peacekeeping operations following the Bosnian War. Things were supposed to be stabilizing, but there were whispers, quiet off, record rumors, of something strange happening in the mountains. Villagers were disappearing, entire towns abandoned overnight. The locals called it the darkness, but none of them would talk about it directly. Anytime we asked, they'd lower their eyes and cross themselves. Our unit was deployed under the radar, sent in to figure out what the hell was going on. On paper, it was a recon mission to investigate reports of rogue militias hiding in the mountains. But from the start, something felt wrong. Command was unusually tight-lipped even for them. They told us nothing except for coordinates and the standard assess and report briefing. No backup, no extraction plan. It was me, Chief Petty Officer Stevens, and three other guys. Men I trusted with my life. We were a tight-knit group, and we'd been through a lot together. But none of us were ready for what we found out there. We dropped in at night, the Black Hawk touching down in the shadow of the mountains. The air was thick with fog, and the only sound was the wind whispering through the trees. It was eerily quiet. No birds, no animals, not even the distant hum of insects. Just silence. 
Stevens led us through the woods, moving cautiously toward the abandoned village our intel had flagged. The place was ancient, crumbling stone houses scattered along a narrow path that wound deeper into the valley. As we moved through the village, our flashlight sweeping the area, it became clear that no one had lived there for a long time. Yet there were signs of recent disturbance, footprints in the dirt, doors hanging open, and the smell of something. Something rotting. Got a bad feeling about this, Stevens muttered as we moved forward, his voice low but tense. I could feel it, too. An unnatural heaviness in the air, like the very land itself didn't want us there. We set up camp just outside the village, keeping a low profile, scanning the area. That night, something changed. It was subtle at first, a flicker in the corner of your vision, a shadow that moved just beyond the tree line. But it wasn't long before things escalated. It started with one of the guys, Corporal Diaz, swearing he heard whispers coming from the forest. At first we thought it was just the wind playing tricks on him, but then it got louder, like someone or something was right there in the darkness, watching us. Stevens tried to radio for backup, but all we got was static. That was the first real sign that we were on our own. The next morning we found tracks leading away from the village. Not human tracks, though. These were large, too large clawed like something dragged itself through the dirt. I've hunted every kind of animal you can think of, but I've never seen tracks like these. Stevens ordered us to follow them, even though every instinct screamed at me to turn back. We moved deeper into the mountains, the terrain becoming more treacherous. The fog thickened, cutting our visibility down to almost nothing. The deeper we went, the stronger the feeling grew, that we weren't alone. Something was out there watching us, tracking us. By nightfall, the fog was so dense we could barely see five feet in front of us. That's when we lost Stevens. One minute he was there, leading the group and the next. Gone. No sound. No struggle. Nothing. We called his name. Scoured the area. But there was no trace. No tracks. Just nothing. It was like he'd vanished into thin air. We set up camp again that night, hoping Stevens had just gone ahead to scout the area. But in the back of our minds, we all knew something had taken him. Something not human. That night was the worst of my life. It started with the whispers again, this time louder, coming from all around us. Voices speaking in a language none of us recognized. The air grew colder, unnaturally so, and the fog seemed to close in on us, suffocating, thick. The sounds of footsteps crunched on the ground, but there was no one there. Suddenly, Diaz screamed. I turned just in time to see him pulled into the fog, yanked back by something we couldn't see. We fired blindly into the mist, shouting his name, but the only response was the echo of his screams fading into nothingness. We ran. We abandoned everything, our camp, our gear, and just ran, hoping to outrun whatever was hunting us. The forest felt endless. The trees towering over us like silent sentinels. The fog clung to us, following us no matter how fast or far we moved. That's when we saw it. Just a glimpse. A figure in the fog, tall and twisted, moving unnaturally fast. Its eyes, they were glowing. Not with light, but with something darker, something ancient and malevolent. It wasn't human. Hell, I'm not sure it was ever human. We never made it back to the village. We found a cave deep in the mountains and holed up there until daylight. By then, there were only two of us left, me and Petty Officer Lynch. He was badly wounded, his arm slashed open by whatever had come after us. But somehow, we survived the night. At dawn, the fog lifted and we made our way down the mountain, moving like ghosts ourselves, silent and hollowed by what we'd experienced. There was no extraction team waiting for us. No reinforcements. It was like command had known what we were walking into and had written us off before we even left. When we finally made it back to base, they debriefed us for hours. We told them everything. The tracks, the whispers, Stevens disappearing. The thing we saw in the fog. But they didn't believe us. Or maybe they did, and they just didn't want the truth getting out. Officially, Stevens and the others are listed as key, lost in the line of duty. 
But I know the truth. Whatever took them, it wasn't human. It wasn't natural. And it's still out there in those mountains, waiting. I've seen a lot in my time as a SEAL. I've faced down death more times than I can count. But that mission in Bosnia, that was something else. Something older. Something evil. And I pray to God it never finds its way out of those mountains. My wife, Maya, and I were driving cross, country. It was our first attempt at the great American road trip. Maya and I rented a small RV, more of a camper than a full-blown RV. We packed up a couple suitcases with plenty of room for any souvenirs, and we hit the dusty trail. We started our journey on the Mother Road, Route 66, driving south from Chicago until we connected to... I-70 and shot straight west through Missouri. The goal was to see those parts of the country we had never seen before, stopping anywhere that seemed interesting, from the plains of Kansas up through the badlands of Wyoming and South Dakota. In Missouri, we saw the world's largest cap gun. In Kansas, we visited the evil Nevil Mewville Museum and the world's largest belt buckle. We love all those kitschy tourist trap places. Eventually, we made it to Colorado, and after a few hours more of driving through amber waves of grain, we saw them, the Rocky Mountains. We made an exit and headed north through the winding mountain highways. The Rockies were gorgeous, snow-capped in the middle of summer. Some of the peaks pierced through the white, fluffy clouds. We saw a sign that read Traffic Tunnel three miles. A little further, and sure enough, there it was, a large tunnel bored directly through the mountain in front of us. A large sign read, Pike Tunnel, longest traffic tunnel in the nation. Please turn your headlights on now. How long is it? asked Maya. That's what she said, I quipped. But she was right. There was no information beyond the detail that this was the longest tunnel in the nation. Can't be more than a mile or two, I said as I watched the little white car ahead of us slip into the darkness. A moment later, we joined it. The tunnel was lit by fluorescence that gave everything a greenish-yellow tinge. On the left-hand side was a raised walkway behind a railing for maintenance access. Initially, I was struck by the incredible amount of work that went into the construction of this man, made marvel. We're under a million tons of Rocky Mountain right now, I said. How many years before this caves in? Maya responded. I shot her a look. Let's save the cave and talk until we're out on the other side. I'm just saying nature will take this back eventually, she continued. I scanned the empty road ahead of us. Where did the other car go? I asked. We were now alone in the tunnel. No cars ahead of us, nor behind us. Huh. They must have sped off ahead. Maybe they're scared of a cave-in. My Spotify playlist had stopped playing. Maya looked at the phone. No cell service. She turned on the radio and spun the dial only to find static. You're not going to be able to pick up a station in here, I said. She turned the volume down. Just wanted to check. If only we had some CDs. This tunnel really keeps going. I would have thought we'd be through it by now, I replied. I looked at the RV's odometer. 45,600 miles. I picked up speed. I wanted to try and catch up to the little white car. Up until this point, the tunnel was a straight shot, but now the tunnel started to curve to the right. It may have been my imagination, but it also felt as though we were descending. Maya felt it too, and she started to get antsy. Where did that other car go? How long is this tunnel? There was an urgency in her voice. I was getting nervous. Claustrophobia was not usually a problem for me. But when I looked down at the odometer and I saw that it had gone up by three miles, my mind began to wander to unsettling places. We were descending in altitude. I could feel it. 
I could see a slope in the lights on the ceiling and the railing of the maintenance walkway. I could feel a pressure in my head, and I was getting cold. Could you grab me a Coke from the back, Maya? I couldn't have Maya getting anxious. That would only start a chain reaction and make me freak out, which would then make her freak out. She unbuckled and ducked into the back of the RV to where we had a cooler stocked with drinks and food. Just as she stepped into the back, I saw something. There standing on the side of the road was a man wearing a reflective safety vest and a hard hat. He was waving to me as I passed him by. Something about him looked strange. I watched him in the side, view mirror as we passed, and he was still watching the RV, still waving at the back of our vehicle as he faded into the distance. Maya reappeared from the back of the RV, coke in hand. She popped it and handed it to me. You look worried. I'm fine, I smiled and took a sip of the coke. Eric, slow down. I slammed on the brakes as I saw what made Maya scream. In the road in front of us was a roadblock. Two reflective traffic sawhorses blocked both lanes of the tunnel. Beyond the roadblock, the lights of the tunnel were dark. There was nothing but a void of blackness. Standing in front of the roadblock was another man wearing a reflective vest and a hard hat. Only this time his hard hat had a light on top which obscured his face. We came to a jolting stop. I turned to Maya. Are you okay? I asked. I'm fine, she replied. It's a cave in, isn't it? God, I hope not. I rolled down the window, leaned out and yelled to the man in the hard hat. Hey, what's going on? The man was about five yards away. He took two steps towards us and then raised a hand to his mouth and yelled. Just doing some maintenance? How long is it going to take? I yelled back. The man made a hand gesture as if he didn't hear me. How long is it going to take? I called again. He made the same gesture. I unbuckled my seat belt and grabbed the door release. What are you doing? I asked. I gotta know what's going on. Eric, just stay here. It might not be safe. I'll be just a second, I said. I pushed the door open and stepped down from the RV. Stay in your vehicle, the man yelled. He took a couple steps towards me with his hand out telling me to stop. What's the hold up? I shouted. The man was a bit closer now, but I still couldn't see his face through the shining light on his helmet. Please stay in your vehicle, he shouted. There was something off about him. Then I heard it. <sighs> oh, a scream or something rolled from deep in the tunnel. The worker turned and looked into the darkness. Then he ran past the barricades, and soon all we could see of him was the light on his helmet. The light disappeared a moment later. What the hell was that? Is someone hurt? I asked. I have no idea, I said. Should we do something? I asked. I just sat there and watched the pitch black tunnel in front of me. I had no idea what to tell her. I checked the side view mirrors. There was still nobody behind us. Where are the other cars? I asked. They must have gotten through before the roadblock. Or maybe they caused the roadblock, Maya replied. I saw another worker a little ways back. We could try to go back and talk to him. We'd be going straight into any oncoming cars. There's a maintenance walkway. We didn't pass him that long ago. We can probably catch him on foot. Maybe we should just wait for the guy to come back. She reached over and grabbed my arm. I squeezed her hand. She was right. I looked out at the tunnel ahead of us. I turned on the RV's high beams, but all I could see beyond the roadblock was more tunnel and more road. I checked my phone. Unsurprisingly, there was no service still. We waited, but the man never came back. It's been twenty minutes, Maya said. How come there hasn't been another car behind us? I was having the same thought. I rolled down my window and stuck my head out. I looked back at the road behind us. It went back about 200 yards before curving out of sight. 
There was no sign of that first worker I saw on the maintenance walkway. I looked at the roadblock ahead of us and clicked on the RV's high beams. There was nothing beyond the roadblock but more tunnel. It didn't look like it was under construction, just very dark. I think we should keep going, I said. What about the roadblock? We'll move those sawhorses out of the way and just drive past, I said as I opened my door. Maya looked at me, then she cast her eyes to the dark tunnel ahead of us. I knew she was processing the same limited options that I was. Driving backwards would be a huge risk in the instance of another car finally coming along. Getting out and walking would take God knows how long. We could have driven ten miles at this point. Forward was our best option. Let's do it, Maya said. We jumped out and quickly pulled the two saw horses out of the right lane. I pulled the RV up past the barriers. Then we jumped out again and put the saw horses back where they were. We didn't need another car to come barreling through. We were finally moving again, slowly. It was pitch black, save for the high beams of the RV. We crept forward at around 15 miles per hour. As the tunnel turned and twisted, my eyes started to play tricks on me. I kept seeing shapes at the furthest point of the tunnel. I kept seeing something standing just at the end of the next bend, but as we rolled forward, there was nothing there. Where are the workers? Maya asked. I don't know. I was done rationalizing. This was all wrong. Traffic tunnels are never this long. My mind started to wander to all the road trip urban legends I'd read about. The killer in the back seat, the disappearing gas station, the pale man in the cornfield. Did we stumble into some strange outlier location? An inn between point on the endless roads that cross this country? Then I saw it. Look, a person, thank God, Maya shouted. As we rounded a curve in the tunnel, a group of maintenance workers entered our view. The three of them stood on the left side of the road, behind two more sawhorses, topped with flashing lights. Two of them faced towards us. The third was facing the other two. The one with his back to us wore a light on his hard hat. Was this the same guy we saw earlier? How did he get this far away? I approached slowly and rolled down the window. Hey, you left us waiting back there, I yelled. There was no response. In fact, all three men were completely silent, and it was hard to tell in the flashing light of the sawhorses, but they looked to be standing completely still. Hello! I yelled again. I pushed open my door and stepped out onto the pavement. Eric, wait. I held up a finger to my eye. Just a second. I slowly stepped towards the three men. Hello? No response. What the F? The bright lights of the sawhorses obscured their faces. I kept moving closer. Hey, what's going on? Then I saw it. Their faces, they were plastic. In front of me stood three mannequins. I backed away toward the RV. Then I turned and walked hurriedly to the vehicle. I was seriously freaked out, but I didn't want to alarm my... I climbed into the driver's seat and slammed the door shut. They're mannequins. Why, what? I, I don't know. I looked back over at the three figures and my blood ran cold. The hard hat mannequin had somehow turned around to face us. All three figures appeared to be watching us now. Then we heard it. A loud resonant banging on the side and then the roof of the RV. What the hell was that? Maya whispered. We listened, holding our breath. Then, a shuffling sound. Something was moving on or in the RV. Stay here, I said. I got up. Eric, wait. I moved to the back of the RV. It was dark. I went for a drawer in the kitchenette space and pulled out a flashlight. I moved to the rear of the RV, the bedroom. My flashlight illuminated an empty room. Whoever is back here, I have a gun. 
a shitty bluff, but I didn't see anything. I shone the light out of the windows of each side of the RV. Nothing. Then I heard it. A shuffling sound from right above me. I looked up and screamed. Damn! On the roof of the RV, staring through the skylight, was a woman with vacuous black eyes and a dead smile. Her stringy black hair dangled down towards me, casting thin black shadows across her horrible pale face. Maya, drive! Fast! I screamed. Maya jumped over to the driver's seat, shifted into gear, and stomped on the gas. The RV was clunky, but it could move when it needed to. We lurched forward and I fell back. I trained my flashlight up onto the skylight again and the woman was gone. I scrambled to my feet and looked out of the side windows. Did Maya shake her off? There was no sign of the woman. I moved to the passenger seat, breathing heavily and sweating. What happened? She asked, keeping the RV at a steady 50 miles per hour. There was a woman on the roof, I said flatly. I realized now that I was in a kind of shock. A woman? Her eyes were black. Maya just looked at me, then back at the tunnel ahead of us. There's something wrong with this tunnel, I whispered. Maya pointed at the road ahead. Look. I looked out at the tunnel. There were more mannequins, a lot more mannequins. They were positioned on both sides of the road. They were all facing us, and even though I never saw them move when I looked in the side view mirror, they were somehow still facing us, turning to watch us as we drove past. Watching without eyes. Just keep driving, I said. As we drove on, the mannequins crowded the sides of the road more and more. There were thousands of them. Eventually, they were so close that some of their outstretched arms hit the side of the RV. They were closing in on us squeezing our path forward. One stood in the middle of the road. I don't think I can get around it. Run it over. Don't stop. The RV smashed into the mannequin. Its head shot forward and bounced against the windshield and the vehicle shuddered as it rolled over the body. Soon there were two in the road, then three. I could see where this was going. Pretty soon there would be too many for the RV to ram through. But God damn it, we were going to get through as many as we could. Speed up, Maya. Crash. The sound was surreal, smashing into mannequin after mannequin at nearly 60 miles per hour. Hands, legs, heads, and torsos flew. The windshield cracked, the RV shuddered and screamed, and eventually slowed down despite the screaming engine. I'm certain the axle was jammed up with lifeless plastic body parts. Eventually, we came to a stop. She won't move, Maya said. She pressed on the gas, but it was no use. The RV just rocked a little bit. Try reverse. She shifted and pressed on the gas. We got some decent movement before running into another jam. There. Yeah. Should we get out and look? Maya asked. I'll go, I said as I grabbed the flashlight and popped the passenger door. Maya unbuckled her seatbelt. We'll go together. We stumbled out of the RV on the passenger side. It was like stepping into hell. Countless lifeless faces stared out at us from the darkness. The only light came from the headlights of the ERV and my flashlight. We clumsily made our way along the side of the RV. The ground was littered with mannequin pieces. I thought to myself, if we could get a couple yards cleared out behind the rear tires, we might be able to back out and get enough momentum to reverse all the way back out of here. Instead, when we got to the back of the RV, my stomach flipped and my heart sank. I was expecting to see a trail of flattened mannequins. Instead, the RV was now surrounded by thousands of perfectly intact mannequins standing at attention as if their ranks had somehow been replenished after our vehicular assault. This is impossible. She started to cry. I held her close. We'll keep moving, I said. It will never end. The tunnel makes no sense. It only curves one direction. I looked at her. What do you mean? 
This whole time, the tunnel has only been curving to the right. It would sometimes straighten out or go left for a few yards, but before too long, we were curving to the right again. We've either been driving in circles or spiraling downwards. So we'll go back the way we came and hope we're not going in circles, I said. We had been driving for hours at this point. Walking back out the way we came would take days. But now that I thought about it, Maya was right. We'd only been curving to the right. This tunnel seemed to be very gradually taking us downwards into the earth. Going forward would not get us any closer to escape. We'll need food from the RV, Maya said. I nodded and we stumbled our way back to the front of the RV, the mannequin's lifeless faces watching us the whole time. I stepped up to the passenger door and nearly fell back when I looked through the window. What the F? I breathed. What I saw were two mannequins sitting in the driver's and passenger seat. How they got in there, I have no idea, but what really made my blood run cold was that they were dressed exactly like Maya and I. They wore identical sets of clothes. The one in the passenger seat had my same new order t-shirt and black jeans. The one in the driver's seat had Mia's green striped sweater and denim shorts. Their plastic faces stared out through the shattered windshield at the endless crowd of mannequins staring back at them. Maya stepped up and saw the uncanny display. What the, uh, Maya echoed. I pulled myself up into the ear air V and slowly stepped around my mannequin doppelganger. I avoided looking into its face, but I swear I could feel it watching me as I stumbled around it. Maya followed and we made our way into the back of our dark RV. Luckily, we had just stocked our cooler full of delay meat and water not long after crossing the Colorado state line. I handed Maya the flashlight and pulled open the cooler. I filled a backpack full of food and water. I turned and saw them. My mannequin double had somehow moved. It was standing in the aisle watching us. Maya's doppelganger was still seated in the driver's seat, but had turned to peer back at us with its eyeless gaze. Maya saw the look in my eyes and turned. She screamed when she saw them and backed into me. I put my arm around her and... We stood there a moment, letting our skyrocketing heart rates return to Earth. Let's get out of here, I said. I slid the backpack onto my shoulders. Maya joined me at the door. I looked into her eyes. Are you ready? She nodded. I kissed her. I love you, I said. I love you, she said. The look on her face killed me. She was terrified. I'm sure the look on my face was similar. I opened the door and we stepped out. We again stumbled to the back of the RV. Once we were clear of the RV and all the crushed mannequin body parts, it became easier to find footing, though weaving through an endless crowd of lifeless people was a slow process. It was pitch black. Without the flashlight, we wouldn't be able to see a foot in front of us. As I walked, the beam of light created the illusion of movement in the crowd. At least I hoped it was an illusion. The limbs of the mannequin seemed to stretch and turn, but the only sound was that of Maya and I shuffling our way through the crowded tunnel. Things went on like this for what felt like hours. Maya and I were sweating and aching. I was about to suggest we stop and rest, but then I saw it and I froze. Out in the crowd, beyond rows of blank faces, I saw a pale face, black hair, and a dead smile. I saw two vacuous eyes staring right at me. My, do you see her? I whispered. See who? I slowly raised my arm and pointed. It was the woman, or whatever it was, that stared back at me through the skylight on the roof of the RV. Oh, my God! My eyes squeaked. I could see now that the pale-faced woman was tall, a few inches taller than the mannequins. As I pointed, she stared back at me with a terrible grin. What do we do? Maya whispered. I raised the flashlight and pointed it right at the pale-faced woman. I thought maybe this would scare her off. I was wrong. 
The light only made her appear more unsettling as she stared back unflinchingly. What do you want? I yelled. She only stared back at me. She was as still as the mannequins. We have to keep going, I whispered. Maya didn't respond. Her body was tense as she held on to me. We've come this far. We can't turn back again, I continued. I pulled Maya's hand and we continued on our way through the mannequins, keeping the distance between us and her as wide as possible. As we moved past, she kept watching us. Though her movements were imperceptible to us, her eyes never left us. Like one of those portraits whose eyes appear to watch you no matter where you stand. Finally, we got far enough that she was out of sight, but the thought of her being somewhere behind us only unsettled me further, and I quickened our pace. As the hours wore on, there was no sign of the pale-faced woman, and the crowd of mannequins began to thin out. They still populated the tunnel from one end to the other, but there was more space between them, allowing Mia and I to walk more freely. The mannequins on the maintenance walkway on the side of the tunnel seemed to thin out as well, and I decided it would give us a better vantage if we were walking up there. I helped Maya climb up the railing that bordered the walkway, then I climbed up behind her. The walkway was elevated three or four feet above the roadway. We could easily see over the heads of the mannequins in both directions. There was, of course, no end to the tunnel in sight. We kept walking. The mannequins continued to thin out, but they were different now. They were mannequins dressed as maintenance workers again, but also mannequins dressed as families and businessmen. There was even a group of mannequin nuns standing in a single file line, heads bowed in prayer. Needless to say, we passed none of this on the way into the tunnel. I was feeling very hopeless that we were going to be able to find our way out. I was far beyond speculating how this was at all possible. It's not possible. And even if it were, there is no good reason for someone to do this to us. The only explanation was the supernatural. Then I saw her. Rather, I saw them. Arranged in the middle of the tunnel was a circle of mannequins with long black hair and tattered cloth. They looked exactly like the pale-faced woman, minus any facial features. I kept a close watch on them as we passed to make sure they didn't start following us. The door, Maya shouted. Maya pointed a few paces ahead of her. There was a door leading into the wall of the tunnel. We ran towards it. Maya grabbed the handle, turned it, and pulled. It was heavy, and Maya had to brace her foot on the wall to get it moving. The metal door groaned as if it hadn't been opened in years. Finally, it was open enough to see past. It was a hallway. It went out about five yards, then turned right at a 90-degree angle. The strangest part was the design of the hallway. It wasn't cement or pavement like the tunnel. The walls were wood-paneled, and the floor was covered in a thick carpet like a house from the 1970s. I say we see where this takes us, Maya said. There was no reason to disagree, but I wasn't going to get us trapped in there. I opened up my backpack and took out a water bottle. I opened it and handed it to Maya. She drank half, then I drank the other half. I slowly closed the door, shoving the empty water bottle in the crack to keep it from closing all the way. I turned to Maya. Okay, let's go. We slowly made our way down the quiet hallway. We got down to where the hallway cornered to the right, and that's when we heard it. Kai chuck I whipped around. The door had closed behind us. I ran back to it and tried to push it open, but it was no use. There was no way it closed on its own. Someone had to have removed the water bottle. Our path had been chosen for us. There was no turning back. We continued down the hallway. We turned right. The hallway continued, then turned right again. That should have led us right back to the tunnel, but it didn't. This part of the hallway went on far longer than was possible without running into the tunnel. Then it turned right again. It went on like this. Sometimes the section of the hallway was 20 feet long. Sometimes it was 20 yards long. Sometimes it was 3 feet long. But it always turned to the right. 
At first, it was a relief to be somewhere other than the cold, dark tunnel. But the hallway very quickly became claustrophobic, and before too long, I heard someone walking behind us. We had stopped to take a break, and I heard a third pair of footsteps on the carpet coming from behind us. I backtracked to the last corner. I was terrified as I slowly peeked around the corner, tense and waiting to see the vacuous eyes and inky black hair of the pale-faced woman. But there was nothing there. I wasn't about to backtrack any further. There was no one there, I whispered. Maya slumped against the wall and slid down to the carpet. I think I need to rest, she said. I put my backpack down on the ground for Maya to use as a pillow. She laid her head down and was passed out in seconds. I had no idea how long we had been walking at this point. I stood leaning against the wall. My body was telling me to rest, but I couldn't risk falling asleep. I had to keep watch. I knew she was following asleep. I took in the details of the hallway for the first time. The carpet was a dull brown and the walls a cheap wood paneling. The hanging lighting fixtures were shaded by stained glass, something you might see in an old diner. Who built this place? Did someone pick out the carpet and the lighting fixtures? Did a team of workers blast these tunnels into the earth? Or has this place always existed? Was this purgatory? I began to feel dizzy. I was panicking. My heart felt like it was trying to escape my chest. I slumped to the floor and tried to slow my breathing. I closed my eyes. I shot up in a panic. I had fallen asleep while I was meant to be keeping watch. I snapped to my feet and looked around. Maya was still asleep on my backpack. Then I noticed that the hallway had changed. A few paces away, there was now a plain wooden door in the wall. I slowly approached it. I put my ear to the door and I could hear what sounded like TV static and the low murmur of voices. I discreetly grabbed the door handle and turned it slowly. I felt the latch bolt clear and I carefully cracked the door just enough to peek inside. It was dark so it took a second for me to register what I was seeing. I saw a small boardroom. A long table in the center was surrounded by seated men in suits. At the end of the table stood another man next to an old cart TV that was playing static. This was the only source of light in the room, and all the men around the table were turned towards the TV. Suddenly the screen flickered from static to a solid dark background, and some warped New Age style Muzak began playing. Then the words appeared on the screen that terrified me like nothing else before. In plain text, the words read, You will lose her. I froze as I knew these words were meant for me. I watched with terror as the men seated around the table slowly turned toward me in unison. They were mannequins. The TV screen then clicked off and they continued staring at me as I could barely make out their forms through the near pitch darkness. I quickly pulled the door shut and whipped around to look at Maya. I had a horrible feeling of dread that when I turned around, she would be gone like the message on the TV promised. Eric, what are you doing? Maya was leaning up and staring at me. Thank God, there was Maya right where I left her. I pointed at the door and said, this door appeared, and I... What door? she interrupted. I turned, and sure enough, the door was now gone. I explained what happened to her but I left at the message that appeared on the screen. You will lose her. Those words still burned in my brain. I tried to force them out. We drank water, ate granola, and then got moving again. Hallways, endless hallways. After a couple hours of walking, we started to hear music. There were small speakers in the corners of the ceiling. I recognized it as the same New Age music that played on the TV in the boardroom. The melody drilled into our minds, combined with the dull aesthetics of the quiet hallways and the endless right turns, the music had a hypnotizing effect. The lengths of the halls became more uniform, that is to say the straight section of hallway was about seven paces, then a right turn, then seven paces and a right turn. 
I think we're walking in circles. Or I square, Maya said. I looked at her and took out a bottle of water. I peeled off the plastic label and dropped it on the floor. Then we kept walking. Seven paces, right turn. Seven paces, right turn. Seven paces, right turn. And there it was. Maya was right. The label from my water bottle lay in the middle of the hallway. Somehow we had been led into a loop. I lost it. I kicked the wall repeatedly and screamed. Maya just leaned her back against the wall. This was our dynamic. If one of us lost it, the other became zen and thought of a solution. More often than not, I was the one to lose it. I finally stopped freaking out. There has to be a way out. A door, Maya said. We would have seen it, I replied. A hidden door, she said. She turned around and ran her hands along the cracks of the wood paneling. Most likely on the outer wall, she said. She beat her fist on the wall, listening for a change in the sound. I exhaled heavily, sweating and tired, and I started searching the wall as well. We checked the whole first wall, nothing. We checked the second wall, nothing. The third, nothing. The final wall, nothing. I gave up and slumped on the floor. Maya immediately went over to the other side of the hall and started checking the inner wall. What are you doing? I thought you said it would be on the outer wall, I asked. Then we heard it. Maya beat the wall, and instead of the dead thud, we heard a resonate boom. A door? I shot up and started tapping the wall with Maya until we found where the door ended. It was the width of about four wooden panels. I lined myself up in the center, lowered my shoulder, and pushed. It moved. It barely moved, but it was enough to confirm this actually was a door. I recentered and tried again, lowering my center of gravity. I pushed as hard as I could. The door pushed inward about three inches. Then Mia joined in. We slowly moved the door. Five inches, then ten, then fifteen, then twenty. Then Maya slipped inside. I had a moment of panic as she disappeared into the darkness and those haunting words came back into my mind. You will lose her. I darted past the doorway, falling through the threshold and hitting the concrete floor. I looked up and there was Maya, thank God. I promised myself I'd never let her out of my sight again. The exit, Mia said. She looked and sounded as if she were a thousand miles away. I got to my feet and followed her gaze. What I saw nearly brought me to tears. We were back in the tunnel, but there was light. About a mile down was the mouth of the tunnel, and daylight pouring in. Beautiful daylight. I grabbed Maya tight and kissed her. Thank God, she cried. We started moving. Nothing was going to slow us down this time. We sped up into a run down the maintenance walkway towards that beautiful sunlight. As we approached, something else came into view. Parked in the middle of the roadway was a large vehicle. It couldn't be. It was. Our RV sat in the road waiting for us. We ran all the way to it, pulled open the passenger side door and climbed in. There were no mannequins to be seen. I fell into the driver's seat and Maya handed me the keys. I turned over the engine, the most beautiful sound I'd ever heard. I shifted into gear and floored it towards the sunlight. As we got closer, I could see the green of trees and the blue of the sky. We were maybe 100 yards away. I turned to Maya, tears in my eyes. And what I saw turned my blood to ice. Just beyond Maya's window, that horrifying pale face grinned at me. The pale-faced woman was somehow floating outside of the ear V. Before I could say anything, her hand smashed through the window and gripped Maya by the throat. Then, in one horrible motion, the thing pulled Maya screaming through the window and disappeared. I slammed on the brakes, just as the RV passed through the exit of the tunnel and sunlight flooded the cab of the RV. I threw it in park and shot out of the door, screaming. My, uh, Maya? I screamed over and over. I rounded the front of the RV and looked back at the tunnel. 
and what I saw shattered my mind. The tunnel was gone. There was only open road. I had lost her. I was about 26 years old when this event happened, about nine years ago. A friend and I decided to go on a two-week road trip from Kansas, Colorado, Utah, and all down the West Coast. We camped the whole way and had an incredible time, other than occasionally having trouble finding campsites. One day, after a fun, gluttonous night in Portland, we decided to camp on Mount Hood, it was the middle of the summer, so we expected to see other campers on the mountain, even though it was a weekday. We had to drive pretty far up in search of a campsite, because all of the ones towards the bottom were closed due to fallen trees or trees that would be falling if a strong breeze came through. I don't know what that was about, but it was a beautiful mountain with natural spring water and clear rivers. We were excited to be there. We saw a couple of old men fishing on the way up and one family camping. They appeared to be Native American, and there were about five of them. I don't think these details matter, just describing in as good of detail as I can remember. We drive up quite a ways before finding a nice private camp spot and setting up camp for the night. We walk around gathering wood, talking about the night in Portland and setting up the tent. The time comes for us to go to bed, and my friend falls asleep. I'm still lying there trying to fall asleep when I hear footsteps and leaves crunching. This puts me on high alert since there weren't many people camping and none close by us. I lay there with my heart racing and listen. I begin to hear voices, and I try to nudge my friend awake. But she is out and not really waking. I continue to listen, and I start to make out the voices and words. It's our voices having the exact conversation we were just having around the campfire, not even an hour before. I didn't last long before silence returned. Needless to say, I had a very hard time sleeping that night. I only ran once. My grandparents' house was never haunted till my grandmother died. They had the house built, and my grandmother designed the place. After my grandfather died, my mom had inherited the home and moved in. There was a physical altercation between my sister's boyfriend and my mother. Police were involved, and he ran. Fine, he was gone and not allowed to return. So the next day, to avoid another incident between mom and her boyfriend, I went to mom's and started taking my sister's stuff out of there. As I was moving things, there were noises upstairs, typical of my nan after her death, and I thought nothing of them. As I am moving things from the second floor out to the vehicle, I'm going down the steps, and all of a sudden I'm swooped upon by spirit. I had all the hair on my body rise and heard static in my left ear and whispering chatter through that static. I hauled ass outside. I calmed myself down, realizing it had to be my nan who accosted me. I went back inside and yelled at her, never to do that again, and she'd scared me to death. I didn't hear from her ever again. I think she'd been disturbed by the incident that took place the day before in the home, and she was in my ear literally venting about it. It did scare me for sure. Weirdest paranormal experience I ever had. When I was a teen, we lived in a nice, safe, and trouble, free apartment complex in Istanbul, Turkey. It was 2005. I spent my childhood there and have some good memories. There is, however, one troubling moment that I can't get over. So one day, I and my friends were playing football, having a blast just like any other kid at that age, until one of my friends stopped in his tracks and pointed at one of the apartment blocks with shock on his face. He asked if we could see it. What all four of us were facing was a man standing motionless at the edge of an apartment rooftop. 
Now, this may not sound incredibly spooky to you, but it scared us to death as 16-year-old teens, and we didn't know what to do. We were looking at each other, completely baffled until this man just jumped from the roof of an eight-story apartment building to his certain death. We bolted it out of there and went straight to our parents, all pale-faced and shaky, and this was probably the reason why they took us seriously, and instead of shrugging us off with kids being kids. Now here is the part which puzzles the crap out of me. Our parents checked the proximity for a dead body, but to no avail. Officers arrived some time later for the same purpose, because apparently people alerted the emergency line about a depressed man on a rooftop. So briefly, this guy jumped to his death and vanished into thin air. We, as 16-year-old kids, witnessed him fall along with some other people who went as far as calling the police. Yet again, there was absolutely no trace of a man whatsoever. Have you had similar reports like this, or will this keep haunting me forever? Mom and I were camping in a pretty standard campground when I was a kid and decided to stroll to the river, walked past another campsite, where we'd seen a man hanging out earlier that day, and strangely, the door to his truck was open and his dog was just kind of sitting there by the front end of his truck. Didn't think much of it and continued to the water. After a while, we walked back to our campsite and the truck door was still open and Doggo was still sitting in the same spot. We thought it was weird, but didn't figure anything was wrong. Turns out the old guy was dead in front of his truck and we couldn't see him when walking past. Someone found him and called the sheriff in. It was weird to realize that we were feet from a dead guy when just strolling through the campground. Still to this day, when I think about his good boy and how he basically stood watch over his master, it makes me sad. Poor thing. Indiana resident here. I wasn't there, but according to my three friends, they were walking out to one of their barns where their band gear was at night and saw two glowing red orbs appear from under a truck about 20 yards away. It flew through the air in sync, and then they said it disappeared in opposite directions. They also said it made an ear-piercing sound. I did hear the sound one time when we were taking a break between jam sessions. Sounded like a high-pitched banshee shrieking with a metallic filter and reverb on top of it. Sent a shiver up our spines, but the guy that lived there said he heard that frequently. He said it probably came from the pond that's about 200 yards behind his house, but he's never going to check it out. I'm not one who has bought into any real conspiracy theory, but it does often seem that in dealing with the wilderness there is quite a bit that officials aren't exactly honest about. Probably simply because they don't want to panic the public, I'd assume, but still. The only other weirdest thing I can admit to experiencing, and both my mother and my sister were there when this happened. My mother used to work for the government and had requested some hard to get documents I'm not sure on what. Well, it was a spring day. She, my sister, and I were out on our deck in a black helicopter with no markings. And a crew wearing only black literally came and hovered next to the deck. They made eye contact with all of us, stayed there, and after a minute or two left. Unfortunately, this was in the early 90s, so short of having a disposable camera ready, there was no great way to document it. We were all pretty skeeved out after that for a fair bit. But honestly, it could simply have been some military peeps just screwing around with locals for all I know. I'm not going to assign some huge conspiracy to it. Just really strange. It seems like there are a lot of weird things that happen in the northern Mide West.
A few weeks back, I posted on a thread about rural hauntings, cryptid encounters, and folklore. I figured this would be a good place to post a little more, and those who were interested in the documentary, it's still in production. But, getting to the encounters, we're from a small town in southern Ohio, about an hour east of Cincinnati. This town has been plagued with people dying young, and in some pretty gruesome ways. Google Cheryl Fossil as an example. Many believe that this is caused by, or the cause of, activity around the area. There's a section of woods that seems to have concentrated activity throughout. The woods in question are surrounded by two churches, a hospital and area of housing. Now, as full disclosure, things do not happen every time we go in. But when things do happen, things happen off of the charts. The most common things that we've experienced are what we've dubbed the geeks. We call these things geeks because they are tall, sometimes 12 feet from toe to crown, and gangly and move awkwardly, although they move between trees swiftly. They never present themselves outwardly, only glimpses of them as they move between trees. The scariest thing about them, however, is the sound right before they start moving almost like a deep groan. The second that I wanted to talk about is Hydra. Only one of us have seen this thing, and so far there has been only one witnessed. It is a small primate-like creature with a face like a hideous woman, a chimpanzee body, long greasy black hair, and boils on its back. Blood red boils. The member of our group who had encountered this thing refuses to tell us what Hydra had spoken to him about. These are some of the things that we've encountered. We're working on a documentary about what's happened in this area, in the town itself. I will keep everyone who is interested updated on the findings and eventual release of the documentary itself. If anyone has any similar experiences, I would love to hear about them. So the area my grandparents lived in was somewhat known for Bigfoot sightings, and my grandfather had seen some sign of it. A set of footprints in the snow that strode uninterrupted over a four-foot fence, calls from the forest, etc. They live at the edge of a state park in Ohio. I've seen plenty at this point, but back then I hadn't had any experience with the paranormal. At least as far as I knew. Bigfoot fascinated me because of all cryptids it seemed the most plausible and I'd spent some of my week there watching documentaries and discussing it with him. Now he wasn't much of a prankster but it had happened enough that when something actually happened I thought it was him. I'd just gotten into bed at the end of their trailer. Was there for maybe twenty men insomnia when I heard this call outside the window passing by quickly down the hill. Imagine an orangutan hot, not a loud, just that idle, huffing call they do at each other. Pitch that down a ways, and then have it coming from lungs that should belong to a bear or moose. As I said, my first thought was to rationalize. That's Grandpa messing with me. He almost had me, too. This thought lasted until I remembered the way the trailer sits on the hill. The bottom of these big windows is sitting six feet off the ground. The noise had definitely come from above me in bed near the tops of the window. So whatever made that noise was two or three feet higher, and the old guy didn't own any stilts. I wish I'd gone to look, but the realization that something that massive had decided to make a noise right next to me just struck me with paralyzing fear. I was playing around an abandoned area within sight of the trailer later that same week, jumping around rotting beams and poking through whatever was left when I just stopped. There was just a massive, imminent presence behind me all of a sudden. No noise alerted me. I hadn't seen anything move. It was just pressure, that same pressure thinking back on it. Nothing inherently threatening in it. Just the sheer weight of the gaze is what got me running. I felt the presence of ghosts, at least one demon, what I'm pretty sure was Eldritch shenanigans, and let me tell you, nothing has had the weight of that, the power. It felt more real and present than I think people can be. Anybody else have something like this? Not a sighting, but just like a sense of something, 
an impossible noise or just a too close encounter? My husband and I were on the way back home from Navarre Beach, heading towards the Alabama line. It was storming really bad that night. As soon as we were passing Blackwater Forest, it slacked up a bit. We both saw Bigfoot walking across the road. By the time we were coming up on it, it was almost to the other side. He looked so shocked like a deer in headlights. I asked my husband if he saw the same thing that I did, and he agreed. I couldn't believe that we had seen it. A couple of weeks ago, we got sad news that our older woman friend that had stage 4 cancer passed away. Yesterday, her daughter updated everyone with where they were having all the memorial services at, and one of the places just stunned me. They opened a restaurant, and it's called Bigfoot Crossing, exactly in the area that we had seen it. So now I'm wondering how many more sightings. I mean, it's got to be quite a bit. Now I want to go back and check out the area more. Reports of a large bipedal canine resembling a hyena have been circulating around Grand Rapids in the lower peninsula of Michigan. Officer Blackburn had his incident on February 2nd, 1999, and I was the one who responded to the call. We received reports of an unidentified animal spotted on King Highway near Riceland Drive in Comstock Park. Since our jurisdiction covered the entire county, we quickly made our way to the scene. According to the witnesses, they were driving when they suddenly caught sight of something darting across the road and disappearing into the nearby woods. Their description sent chills down my spine. A creature standing about six feet tall, covered in black fur with a long and swiftly moving tail. Its movements were eerily fluid, reminiscent of a kangaroo. They expected it to leap over a nearby ditch, but it never did. The most unsettling detail was that it ran on two legs. Without wasting any time, I ventured into the wooded area, following the tracks I found in the snow. Step by step, I pressed forward, keen on uncovering the truth. The tracks led me deeper into the woods, and for about fifteen minutes I diligently pursued their trail. However, my efforts came to an abrupt halt when the tracks vanished at a steep embankment. The feat of scaling that bank with feet like those I'd seen was impossible, with massive canine feet measuring around twenty inches in length. It was perplexing and added another layer of mystery to the situation. Interestingly, the reports of this creature have only emerged during daylight hours, with no known sightings of the creature at night. This deviation from typical Bigfoot encounters, which mostly occur under cover of darkness, makes it all the more unusual. The witnesses, exclusively rural residents, have shared their experiences of hearing strange sounds before coming face to face with this large bipedal canine figure while engaging in activities such as hunting or hiking. Reflecting on these accounts, I can't help but wonder about the existence of such a creature. It raises questions that linger in my mind. What could be the nature of this mysterious being? And what secrets do the woods hold within their depths? I had ventured into the vast wilderness of the New Mexico woods, a seasoned hunter in pursuit of elusive prey. My target was the elk, its noble presence and impressive antlers a testament to the grandeur of nature. With my trusty rifle in hand, I scoured the landscape, my keen eyes scanning the horizon for any sign of movement. As I peered through the scope of my rifle, a sight greeted me that defied all logic and reason. Amidst the swaying trees and dappled sunlight, a figure emerged, unlike anything I had ever laid eyes upon. It stood tall and upright, a bipedal form that seemed to meld the traits of both man and beast. Its muscular frame was covered in coarse matted fur that glistened in the dappled light. Its elongated limbs hinted at an unearthly strength, and as my gaze fixated on its hands, I could see sharp claw-like appendages that protruded from its fingers, but it was the face that truly sent shivers cascading down my spine. Its visage was a fusion of primal savagery and eerie intelligence, 
The creature possessed a snout, elongated and filled with menacing teeth that gleamed in the sunlight. Its eyes, burning like orbs of molten amber, seemed to hold a depth of knowledge that transcended human comprehension. I could feel my heart pounding within my chest as I grappled with the sheer impossibility of what lay before me. Every instinct within me screamed to take aim and fire, to eliminate this otherworldly being that stood before me. Yet something deep within my soul told me that it would be wrong, that there was more to this creature than met the eye. In a state of awe and disbelief, I watched as the creature disappeared into the dense undergrowth, seamlessly blending with the wilderness from which it had emerged. The haunting memory of its presence lingered in the air, as if an ethereal whisper that urged me to question the boundaries of what I believed to be true. That day I did not succeed in capturing the elk that had brought me into these woods. Instead, I left with a far greater treasure— a profound encounter with the unknown. The experience filled my mind with questions and contemplation, challenging the very foundations of my understanding. This happened in Cairns, Australia. It was New Year's Eve back in 2012, me and a few mates. Some were indigenous. We were at my house in Bayview before heading clubbing as we were talking and having a yarn. I asked my bro if we should go for a walk up the hill. My bro agreed and the rest joined. As we were walking up Bayview, there was a mountain path that you can track up. In the forest mind, you, I heard the trees shake as if something was jumping from tree to tree. I asked the boys if they heard it, but they laughed as we got higher up the mountain path. I saw two black figures, big tank, looking things at the fork of the mountain path. My boys stood frozen, and I had cold chills. As we stared at these things, my aboriginal friend said to me, Let's run now. But my islander friend, being a hero, yelled out and said, And I quote, Balai, nor fright you. Right as he said that these two beings rushed us. They must have been eight or nine foot beings. We bolted down that hill. But we heard the footsteps get closer. As we got to the bottom of the street light, we looked back, and those things stood at the end of the mountain path. And we could all see that these beings had large black wings like an eagle in dark orange eyes. After that, we vowed never to go near the mountain. To this day, I don't know what the heck those things were. One time back in 2008, my daughters and I were heading back to the Dan Res from Sedona, Arizona. We were almost in Del Muerto, Arizona at about 1 a.m. I saw this figure run across the road heading west. You could see right through it. It blended in with the background like Predator the movie. I just thought, you're just tired in seeing things. My oldest was riding shotgun and she says, did you see that, Dad? I thought she was sleeping like her sister. Decades ago, there was this mountain road on a place called Big Hill. It was the main thoroughfare to get from one county to another, and it wound down the mountain through dense tunnels of trees and down long sloping curves. As the story goes, a woman was killed tragically, and when the culprit wanted to dispose of her body, he shoved her in an old dryer and pushed it over the edge down into the woods of the hill. It wasn't unusual for people to dump their waste and unwanted hair, so it would have been just another piece of junk left behind. After that, people started making reports of seeing a woman walking up and down the hill at night, all alone in the dark tree-lined road. People started to say that you should never leave the window cracked when you're traveling Big Hill because drivers have seen her on the side of the road and then suddenly her face in their rear view mirror. She would hitch a ride from the top to the bottom and then would be gone. They always said she was looking for the man who dumped her body and if you didn't want her hitching a ride to always have your windows up so she couldn't get in. Some years later, due to the traffic use of that road, they actually redid it the road entirely, blasted and removed trees, and actually ended up rerouting it entirely to make it better for semis. 
You can see the remnants of the old road off in the woods, and the few remnants where the old road looks like it crosses over where they built the new road. After they built the new road, there weren't any more reports of the woman on the hill. The superstition went away, and the talk of her died down. I think about that from time to time, and I imagine she's still there, walking the old forest road where time has forgotten it, just waiting to find the one who killed her. This past November, I was finishing a two-month project in Wyoming. I worked four, five days during the week and moonlighted as a DJ at a bar in Riverton. Sometimes I would call a friend just to stay awake as I would wake up at four and be up for around 23 hours straight. One night on the phone, I thought I heard a womanly scream. I was parked by the cabin but had no idea where the noise came from. The canyons made directional noises difficult. I waited a few minutes to see if I cucked here it again, but nothing. One night, after closing out DJing at around 2.30 a.m. and heading back 18 miles to the cabin, rented out by a big game travel guide that lived next door. I was sharing with my co-workers. I seen a huge, gnarly beast of an animal with huge fangs and the size of me on the side of the road, with blood-red eyes. It scared the living piss out of me as it was in the general area of the cabin. Since it was still a 200-foot walk in complete darkness and with no firearms with me, I slept in the truck. I woke the next morning and told the boys why I slept in the truck. I ain't gonna lie, I was scared. And after describing what I saw and looking around the cabin, I pointed at a taxidermied mountain lion and said actually it looked just like that. At first nobody believed me, even the big game guide neighbor... Dave said that mountain lions never came down from the mountain or close to town. Eck. It wasn't till later that day his Dave neighbor and his daughter came to warn us that they spotted a mountain lion from their hunting blind a mere 300 meters away. The next day, the mountain lion was hit by a truck. Luckily, not mine. In high school, my best friend's father was divorced and never remarried, so he had lots of free time to travel. One of his favorite things to do was backpack, alone. In the summer of 2010, he decided to backpack through a rather large canyon somewhere Jordan. He had planned on it, taking him a total of five days to hike from one village to the next via this canyon. On his third day in the canyon, he was awoken by a large brown bear, so he pulled out his camera to take a few photos. As he was scrolling through the photos he had just taken, he scrolled one back too far and found a picture of him sleeping in his tent. All in all, he found over a dozen photos of him sleeping inside his tent, with the date stamp being from the night before. He had yet to see a single person during his adventure thus far. After that night, he decided to travel during the night and sleep during the daylight hours. He did this for two days before he could make it to the next village. After that incident, he never went backpacking alone again. I've been going offshore for a couple of decades now. My trips to Alaska have always left a massive impression on me. I think it's the lack of people and the general ominous feeling that the land can give off at times, kind of like people are not really welcome there. When I was crossing the Gulf of Alaska just far enough offshore that you couldn't see the beach, but just the tops of several mountains in Mount Logan, a big bastard, were visible. They looked like teeth and combined with the larger waves, the whole scene did not look welcoming in the slightest. I can see how ancient mariners could easily come back with tales of monster islands after seeing something like that. I've also recovered gear in the middle of the night in Alaska, right before a storm. The seas were actually really calm, but the skies were pitch black and there were no other lights to be seen. Strangely, the lights of our vessel didn't seem to reflect off of anything in the air either and the feeling was that just off the boat in any direction was nothing. Then, of course, are the storms offshore. I've been in shitty weather fairly often, but only a few times did I really reconsider my life choices. 
Getting stuck in a storm is bad, but getting stuck in a storm when shit starts to break on a boat is far worse. You really do get a feeling that the sea might just take you and it's just beating you for days until something breaks. I've only had two occasions where that happened. Both times people actually left the industry when the vessel tied up. The feeling of relief as your vessel limps into port and you have sun on your face once more is breathtaking. I was sitting in the campus cafeteria with my friend Sarah when she began to recount a terrifying experience she had just a few days earlier. She had gone to the fifth floor toilet in the main building, expecting nothing out of the ordinary. As she opened the door, she glanced at the large rectangular mirror above the sinks and saw something that made her blood run cold. In the mirror's reflection, there was a dark figure slumped over the top of one of the toilet stalls. Sarah, usually the type to scream and curse, was paralyzed with fear. She couldn't move or make a sound. Instead, she simply closed the door and walked out, her face pale and her eyes wide. As she finished telling her story, our composition teacher, Miss Adams, happened to walk by and overheard us. Intrigued, she sat down and shared a story of her own. She told us about one of her students who claimed to see dead people. This student, who played the piano, would often practice in the rooms of the sixth building on campus. One day, she confided in Missy's Adams that every now and then, while she practiced, a row of dead people would appear, just standing there and watching her play. At first, Miss Adams thought the student was merely seeking attention, but as the girl described the dead people in more detail, she began to wonder if there might be some truth to the story. As the conversation continued, we all shared stories of strange and eerie encounters on campus. We laughed nervously, trying to brush off the fear and unease that had settled over us. But deep down, we couldn't shake the feeling that there was something more to these stories. A hidden world of spirits and entities, lurking just beyond our understanding. From that day on, the atmosphere on campus felt different. Every time I walked past the main building's fifth-floor toilet or the piano rooms in the sixth building, I couldn't help but feel a chill run down my spine, and the haunting stories shared by my friend and teacher replayed in my mind. My mom's house on her college campus in Ohio had a friendly ghost that would hide things, flip things upside down turn on lights, etc. She and her roommates named the ghost Mary and called her their paranormal roommate. Flash forward to their 10-year reunion and all the roommates visit the house and talk to the current residents. All boys. And upon mentioning the ghost, they were shocked to find out the boys also knew about the ghost and named it Jerry. Flash forward another five years and the girls living in the house have named the ghost Gary. Coincidence that all of the names rhyme? I think not. This one time I had to wake up by 4 a.m. and leave by 5 a.m. I got shower, breakfast, take my stuff and leave my home. It's summertime, so it's dark. I lock the door, walk down the hallway and turn left to reach the elevator's hall. Put my bags down, push the button for elevators, and when I turn around to go back to the opposite wall, I completely froze as I saw a very round head with big, bright, round eyes, less than 30 centimeters above the ground and partially hidden around the corner, staring at me. I recovered my breath, and in curiosity, I stepped towards the creature to see what it was. An alien, a garden gnome, someone left for prank, some other bizarre creature. After my first steps, I heard sounds of steps coming from the hall, where the head was staring at me, and I felt another chill down my spine. The steps were coming closer, and I was scared to death and curious to see what it was. Around the same time, the head turns back, and then it came forward, revealing to be my neighbor's cat, and the steps were from my neighbor. I never felt so scared to death and curious at the same time in my life. Now I know if I really see an alien, I would go towards instead of running away. 
It was really scary and interesting at the same time. About seven years ago, I had a remarkable encounter with two Sasquatch in the Blue Mountains of Walla Walla, Washington. It was shortly after I'd relocated from Houston, Texas, and I decided to take my dad's bug for a drive. I ventured up Mill Creek Road, which led me to Squaw Springs Campgrounds. It was quite a journey, about an hour and a half into the blues on a somewhat gravel road. If I recall correctly, it was either July or August. As dusk settled in, I turned on my headlights while navigating a bend in the road. That's when I spotted them crossing the road. Two impressive creatures. One stood approximately eight feet tall, while the other was around seven feet. They locked eyes with me, and the reflection of my headlights revealed their eyes to be a striking yellow color. The sun's gentle glow highlighted their bodies, making it evident that these were not bears or elk. I brought my vehicle to a halt as they crossed, hoping to catch another glimpse as they disappeared into the woods. Unfortunately, I couldn't see anything further, nor did I detect any peculiar odors. I searched for tracks, but the ground was too hard to find any conclusive evidence. So I returned to my bug and headed home. A week or two later, while shopping at the Eastgate Mall, I stumbled upon a Bigfoot display, arranged by two individuals named Paul Freeman, and West Summerlin. They had set up an exhibit featuring two stuffed Bigfoots. Intrigued, I shared with them my encounter in the blues. They informed me that the creatures I had seen were a male and female couple that had been spotted numerous times. Freeman, in particular, had made notable discoveries uncovering miles of tracks and capturing video footage of Bigfoot in the area. However, over time, it became evident that Freeman had fabricated a significant portion of his evidence, which was disappointing because I believed he possessed genuine material. Nonetheless, I formed a friendship with the Summerlin family and even accompanied them on a search for Bigfoot. Wes, in particular, had a wealth of stories, hair samples, photographs, and more. He never sought to sensationalize the matter. He simply believed, and that was enough. Unfortunately, he was passed away some time ago, and I don't believe any substantial research is ongoing in the area. However, a friend and I still venture into the mountains a couple of times a week, continuing our quest. I know Sasquatch is here. I've seen them with my own eyes. The number of sightings may have decreased since Freeman's departure, leading some to doubt their existence. It's an ironic situation because deep down you know Bigfoot is real. Yet the evidence you stumble upon sometimes points in the opposite direction, despite your first-hand encounters. Back in 2020, one my family took a trip to Lake Sinitla in North Carolina, a beautiful lake that's rich in Native American history and surrounded by mountain trails. We decided to go on one of these trails on an overcast day. I'm not an athletic person and suffer from asthma, so I was behind the rest of my family by myself. About almost halfway through the hike, I heard my sister yell my birth name, but it sounded like it was off the trail. She never calls me by real name, just my nickname. I've had since I was a baby. It sounded like she was scared, so I was very tempted to run off and find her, but I knew my sister wasn't stupid. She wouldn't go off the trail even in case of an emergency. I quickly caught up to the rest of my family, and my sister was there with him, resting on some rocks next to a waterfall, chatting away and taking pictures. I asked my sister if she had called my name. She didn't know what I was talking about. She had been talking to her dad the whole time. I don't know what called my name that day, but I'm glad I didn't listen to it. Who knows what would have happened to me? I haven't been to that trail since this encounter. I don't have a clue what called my name. If you're educated on Appalachian folklore, please give me some insight on what happened to me. As the morning sun gently streamed through my window, I had no inkling that my life was about to take an unexpected turn. At exactly 7 a.m., a knock on my door interrupted the tranquility of my morning routine. Curiosity peaked, 
I opened the door to find a man dressed entirely in black standing before me. His sharp attire and serious demeanor immediately grabbed my attention. He wasted no time in introducing himself and ushering me towards a sleek black Buick sedan parked nearby. Something about his presence exuded an air of secrecy and urgency. Without exchanging many words, we embarked on a journey to a nearby cafe. Once seated, he began to speak with a captivating intensity, recounting an extraordinary sighting he had experienced the previous day near Tacoma, Washington State. The images he painted were so vivid and detailed that it felt as though he had transported me to the very scene of the sighting. He described six peculiar objects, donut shaped and unlike anything he had ever seen before. His words were laced with a sense of awe and trepidation, as if he had stumbled upon a secret that demanded utmost discretion. It was then that he made a chilling statement, urging me to remain silent about the incident if I truly cared for my family's well-being. His words hung in the air, and I couldn't help but feel a knot of unease forming in the pit of my stomach. Who was this man, and why was he sharing such sensitive information with me? The gravity of the situation became all too real. Days later, as I attempted to make sense of the encounter, I found myself faced with a devastating turn of events. Two Air Force intelligence officers, Frank Brown and William Davidson, who had been involved in questioning me about the sighting, tragically lost their lives in a plane crash on their return to base. The timing and circumstances were far too coincidental to ignore. Then, fate struck again. Kenneth Arnold, another investigator involved in unraveling the truth behind the sighting, experienced engine failure during a flight back home. Forced to crash, land, he narrowly escaped with his life. The pattern of inexplicable incidents unfolded before me, weaving a sinister tapestry of danger and secrecy. Rumors began to circulate, attempting to discredit the authenticity of my encounter. Some claimed that I had admitted to fabricating the entire story. However, a teletape from the Seattle FBI Special Agent George Wilson to J. Edgar Hoover shed light on the truth. It stated that I had not admitted the story was a hoax, but rather mentioned the possibility of claiming it as such to avoid further trouble. As a park ranger, I've become immune to many weird and strange occurrences in the woods, unnatural-looking animals, strange figures, and even paranormal phenomena have become a part of my everyday life. The rule I follow is simple. As long as I don't interfere in matters that don't concern me, I'll be safer. Most of the time, this rule works, but sometimes things get far too real and far too scary. I belonged to a group of rangers stationed in a remote corner of the park, surrounded by a vast forest. Last week, something happened that I can't simply ignore, like I usually do. My partner, whom I'll call Carlos, and I had patrol duty for the night. We had recently been relocated to a cabin where many rangers had stayed in the past. It was a decent little space with two adjoining rooms and a small bathroom. Luxury was the last thing on my mind in the middle of nowhere, especially considering the nature of our job. Around 7 p.m., after having some tea and reading the news, we put on our gear and left the cabin. With not many rangers stationed nearby at the moment, we had a lot of ground to cover. I personally enjoyed walking in the dark, finding it strangely peaceful. It had been scary in my early years as a ranger, but over time, I found solace in the tranquility it offered. I once asked Carlos if he preferred patrol duty in the dark, but he didn't care for it. Most people wouldn't. As we walked, I observed the thick, tall trees, the moist brown soil, and the cool breeze. The holy trinity of good vibes, in my opinion. I would have liked to listen to some music, but it tended to make me drowsy, so I settled for the random noises of the night. The wind oscillated between sudden gusts and gentle breezes, creating a rhythmic symphony of rumbling leaves and crackling bushes. We walked in silence for an hour before getting bored and engaging in some small talk. Carlos began by cracking pathetically lame jokes, which eventually transitioned into sharing horror stories. 
Despite his orthodox background and belief in the paranormal, his stories were genuinely spine-chilling. Around two or three in the morning, we sat down on a fallen tree. I took out some juice, but it felt unnaturally cold for the weather. The condensation on the outside surprised me. I didn't remember bringing them that cold. Looking back, it should have been a major red flag. As we shared more stories, Carlos was in the middle of telling a particularly eerie tale about a flying vinegar. Dip vampire from the Philippines when I heard a groan. My instincts told me it was the sound of an injured creature, but it didn't feel like an animal. It sounded human, like the grunts of an older woman in pain. The groan was distinct, and both Carlos and I had jumped up from the log simultaneously. He had heard it, too. I nodded at Carlos, and he pointed his flashlight in the direction of the sound. The groan came again, a little more distant this time. I called out, but there was no response. With my right hand on my firearm and my flashlight in my left, I followed the direction of the voice, repeatedly calling out. The groan echoed once more, and we increased our pace. I led the way while Carlos hurriedly trailed behind, continuously calling out, Hello? Is anybody there? After a minute of walking, we discovered the source of the voice, a short, pale old woman wearing a black cape. She was facing towards us, but looking straight down, mumbling something. Her appearance sent shivers down my spine. She was bald, and her skin was a dead-looking dark blue. Her cape was tattered and baggy, and there was an unmistakable sense of unnaturalness about her. But in the off chance that this was a human in need of help, we were obligated to assist her. Carlos approached the woman cautiously, asking if she was hurt. When she looked up, I saw something that chilled me to the core. Her eyes were pitch black, devoid of any humanity. They seemed empty, as if there was nothing behind them. Her skin, too, had an eerie, lifeless quality. It was then that I noticed her mouth, a gaping ear-to-ear -ear gash on her face. In that moment, everything within me screamed that this wasn't a human being. The unnaturalness of her appearance sent waves of fear coursing through my body. The woman, or whatever she was, suddenly pulled up her hood and shifted her gaze toward me. Without speaking a word, she transmitted something to me telepathically. And then, in an instant, she vanished into thin air, as if she had disintegrated into nothingness. I stumbled backward, feeling a mix of disbelief, terror, and confusion. Was this encounter with an alien or a demonic entity? I looked over at Carlos, and his face was paler than I had ever seen it before. He knelt down, audibly whispering a prayer under his breath. It took me a while to find the strength to get up, my legs still trembling violently but somehow they still functioned. We made our way back to the cabin following the markers on the trees. Once inside, I poured some hot tea while Carlos sat at the table with his head in his hands. It was around 5 a.m., and I couldn't help but feel the weight of the traumatic encounter we had just experienced. I mustered up the courage to talk about what we had seen, but Carlos remained silent, unresponsive to my inquiries. Seeing him in that state made me realize the profound impact this encounter had on both of us. By 9 a.m., I decided to contact my superior and inform them about the incident. However, their response was dismissive, questioning if we had been drinking on the job. Frustrated, I hung up, realizing that we were on our own in dealing with this strange occurrence. We had broken the rule, interfering in a matter that concerned us, and now we had to live with the consequences. Despite the trauma, Carlos and I couldn't resist the pull of the forest. Night after night, we returned to the woods, still following the rule in hopes that it would protect us. This job meant everything to me, and I didn't have a plan B. But deep down, I couldn't shake the fear of encountering that sinister presence again. I tried researching the incident, hoping to find some reference or explanation. It reminded me of the legend of La Llorona a weeping ghost from Mexican folklore. Whatever it was, whether an alien or a demon, it radiated at an undeniable evil. Why it chose to reveal itself to us, I may never know. All I hope for now is that I never have to see it again and that the rule we've abided by for so long will continue to keep us safe.
New Orleans 2005. I remember that night vividly as if it happened just yesterday. I was a police officer responding to a call about a possible break and at the home of an elderly deceased person. Little did I know that this was just the beginning of a series of bizarre encounters that would shake the foundations of our beliefs. As we investigated the case further, another call came in. Two suspicious individuals were spotted prowling around a boarded-up house near the swamps. My fellow officers and I rushed to the scene, ready to confront any potential threats. We approached cautiously, our hearts pounding with a mix of anticipation and fear. In the dim light, we saw them, two men dressed in black suits, standing ominously in the shadows. Without hesitation, we made the decision to confront them. But when we fired our weapons, they vanished into thin air, leaving no trace behind. It was as if they had simply melted away, defying all logic and explanation. We scoured the area, searching for any sign of their escape route, but found nothing. It was as if they had never existed in the first place. Confusion and disbelief filled our minds as we tried to comprehend what we had just witnessed. Weeks later, another unsettling incident occurred. A man claimed to have been abducted by an unknown creature. He described them as tall, pale figures with no hair, their faces resembling skulls. Despite their otherworldly appearance, there were enough human-like features to distinguish them from any known creature. According to the witness, they attempted to communicate, but their language was incomprehensible, a jumble of sounds that defied all linguistic understanding. The encounter left him bewildered and shaken, struggling to make sense of the inexplicable. Officer Mike Farrell, a senior member of the New Orleans Police Department, expressed his frustration in finding any information about these creatures online. He knew that the accounts of these encounters would be met with skepticism and disbelief without concrete evidence. As the reports continued to pile up, each one more baffling than the last, it became clear that there was something extraordinary happening in the swamps of New Orleans. Strange sightings, unexplained phenomena, and a sense of unease permeated the air. One particular incident shared by an off-duty officer sent chills down our spines. He had witnessed a fellow officer disturbed by an encounter during their shift. They had been dispatched for a welfare check on an elderly woman, but upon arrival, the house appeared untouched. No signs of forced entry or any indication that someone had been there. Curiosity got the better of them, and they decided to keep an eye on the property. To their astonishment, they noticed a light flickering in one of the windows, despite there being no visible connection to any source of electricity. Determined to investigate, they rushed inside, only to find an empty house devoid of any signs of life. As they resumed surveillance outside, the officer's attention was drawn to movement in the shadows. Two figures emerged from the darkness, one tall and imposing, the other small and mysterious. They watched in disbelief as the figures approached the house, but before they could react, the figures vanished into thin air, leaving them perplexed and filled with an eerie sense of dread. Something inexplicable hung in the air that night, an electrical charge that added to the surreal nature of the events unfolding before us. These encounters defied all logical explanation, leaving us questioning our understanding of the world and the presence of forces beyond our comprehension. To this day, the strange occurrences around the elderly woman's missing case, the unexplained lights in the house, and the enigmatic figures that haunted our thoughts remain unresolved. The incident I'm about to share took place in the bordering area of Guyana in Venezuela. It was an encounter that left the dog owner shaken and described it as both bizarre and distressing. In an interview with the local media, Mr. Amsterdam recounted the events that unfolded on that evening. He had been taking a leisurely walk with his faithful canine companion when, suddenly, a colossal black creature emerged, seemingly intent on attacking him. He referred to it as a big black monster, its presence evoking fear and trepidation. However, his dog, in an act of unwavering loyalty and bravery, leaped into action, putting its life on the line to protect its owner. 
the description Mr. Amsterdam provided of the creature was chilling. He likened it to something out of a nightmare, referring to it as monster-like and diabolical. The creature ruthlessly constricted the dog's neck, snuffing the life out of it with a savage onslaught. After the heinous act, the creature swiftly departed the scene, leaving Mr. Amsterdam in shock and grief. Grateful for his own survival, he expressed gratitude to God and his fallen companion for saving his life. The loss of his beloved pet had left an indelible mark on his heart, as his faithful companion had accompanied him everywhere. As news of the incident spread like wildfire on social media, others came forward sharing their own strange experiences in the same vicinity. Gavin Liverpool, a user on social media, recounted an incident from the early 2000s when a similar creature attacked a dog near the Mercuria police outpost. The creature had vanished into the darkness, leaving the dog to suffer until its demise. Speculations ran rampant among the residents, with some suggesting that the creature could be a werewolf or an evil spirit that only prowls the night. However, there were also those who criticized the dog owner, asserting that he should have been more cautious in protecting his pet. A user named Sheik Abraham expressed deep sympathy for the dog's tragic fate, but also emphasized the importance of human responsibility in such situations. Some residents argued that if the creature had been a black panther, it would have carried its meal into the night instead of simply abandoning it. The incident left the community bewildered and on edge, grappling with the mystery of the creature's identity and intention. It served as a chilling reminder of the unseen forces that coexist alongside us, lurking in the shadows of the night. As the debates and speculations continued, the people of the bordering region remained cautious, wary of the unknown and the secrets it held. I was a young highway patrol officer patrolling the highways of Maryland. It must have been around two or three in the morning. I was driving on Interstate 90, five closing up towards Baltimore, the speed limit in that section of the highway is 65 miles an hour. I would always patrol between the two left lanes so people could see my lights and not get too comfortable driving 20 over the speed limit as I came up to where 695 splits off from 95 northbound heading towards Fullerton. There was this dark figure standing in the right lane ahead of me. It looked like a person, but it did not move at all just stood there next to the barrier wall separating the right lane from the exit ramp for Fullington Avenue North coming out of Philly. So naturally I sped up slowly to catch up with this person, thinking they must be injured or something. As I get closer, still maintaining the speed limit or just under, this thing turns its head to look at me and I notice it has two glowing red eyes in the center of its face. It was very intense and terrifying, but what struck me most was its teeth. This thing had fangs like a wolf or bear, very sharp edges protruding out of its mouth. Its whole demeanor was extremely menacing. It did not look human at all, but when it turned around and stared right at me, I slammed on my brakes in sheer terror. I managed to get myself together after a couple of seconds speeding away, hoping not to lose control of my car and wreck. Ironically, I heard radio communications from another officer about ten minutes later that a driver up the road had witnessed an upright decaying animal running across the road. It was as if it had been hit by a car and left a trail of blood on the pavement for about fifty yards before completely disappearing from sight, crossing into another street. I'm not sure what this thing is, but I've never seen anything like it. Some friends and I would take my truck up in the mountains during the winter time and tow someone on a tube across the snow. We'd drop the tailgate in my old long bed Ford and a few guys would sit in the back with one of those bazillion candlelight spotlights. When I was driving, it'd be fun to make really wide turns in the dark so the person on the tube didn't have the luxury of headlights or taillights to somewhat illuminate their trail. 
The person in the bed of the truck with the spotlight would be funny and shine the light clear off to the side so it was pitch black if you were on the tube. One particular winter night, a snowstorm was rolling in, so we heated up to the usual spot, and it was dark that night. A friend was on the tube. I was driving watching my mirrors as I'd swing him wide enough he had little light to see anything. The guy with the spotlight shined the light clear to the side of the truck, and as I checked my mirror and I made eye contact with a guy dressed in jeans, a red plaid shirt, and a blaze orange ball cap. As we made eye contact, I lost all control of my body for probably only five seconds, but it felt like an eternity. I stopped the truck and turned it around and asked the guys if they saw him. They all said no, so I flipped the truck around and turned on the high beams and they shined the spotlight all over. I got out and looked for footprints in the fresh snow and saw nothing. That night we went back home and I told my dad about the weird experience and he didn't think anything of it. A week later on the news, the police reported finding a body in the area close to where we were and asked for any tips. My old man convinced me to call the police and tell them we were up in the area and saw that guy. I called and the police said they'd send an investigator over. He came over to the house. I recall the same experience saying it happened seven days earlier. As soon as I said that, the investigator asked me, you're sure on your date, which I was positive, and he showed me a picture of the body they found wearing the same red plaid shirt and blaze orange ball cap. He informed me the body had been on the mountain for at least one month, so I must have just seen something. Turns out it was a man who suffered from some mental handicaps and committed saw on the mountain one month prior to when I saw him. Thanks for listening. Hope to see you tomorrow, son.